And so I, I bought um, I bought 30 weapons on the black market and I buried them between Tunis and Egypt. And I designed my own evacuation plans. I buried communications kits, money. That's why I say as a good leader, don't manage your ego and listen to your team. A bad leader is the opposite of that. <laughs> One who thinks his ego, they know everything and everyone else should, should listen to, the, to them. Before I did a show, I wasn't aware of all these units around the world. You know, for me, um, I knew about the SAS, the SBS, SEAL Team 6 and Delta Force because they were the guys that I worked with. I wasn't aware about all these units and also the influence that both UK and US have on them and their training. Hello, I'm Rob Lawrence, EMS One writer and broadcaster and also Police One contributor. Today, I'm going to be talking to Dean Stott, a former member of the Tier 1 UK Special Forces, the Special Boat Service, also worldwide security and evacuation expert, Guinness world record holder, and also now star of the Netflix show Toughest Forces on Earth, where Dean and two of his colleagues visit some of the most elite special forces in the world to observe and take part in their training. Dean Stott was born in Swindon in the United Kingdom, son of a serving soldier. Dean followed his father in the family footsteps and enlisting as a soldier in the British Army's Royal Engineers as a sapper. His early career saw Dean become a qualified mechanical handling equipment mechanic, a physical training instructor, and then Dean volunteered to become an army commando and work within a Royal Marine Commando Brigade. In the course of our chat, we will discuss Dean's career, his special forces life, civilian private security, his remarkable Guinness World Record, and his new Netflix life, and spoiler alert, his friendship with Prince Harry. Throughout our discussion, we identify the many lessons for police, fire, and EMS on leadership, motivation, endurance, resilience, and extreme focus. We join the conversation as Dean and I discuss the British Army All Arms Commando course and the requirements to become an Army Commando. So I then volunteered for the All Arms Commando course, um, put that um, that football uh, sporting career aside and then focus on that. But for me, I like to be busy. You know, I don't like to just be in and around camp. So any opportunity I got, I was volunteering for courses and, and try to sort of better myself as well. So this is probably where we can do some transatlantic explanation at this point, of course, because you have the US Marine Corps that have every type of arm, whether it's artillery, whether it's engineers. Um, I think they've just gotten rid of the tanks, but they used to have that. And so that was almost self-contained. In the UK, the Royal Marines are an arm of the Navy and all of those specialist elements, whether it's engineering, whether it's artillery, yeah. come from the Army. And so therefore you elected to do the commando training in order to be the Army guy serving with a Marine unit. That's it, yeah. So the, the, the Royal Marines, when they deploy, they need artillery assets, they need engineer assets. And so that comes from the army. But for you to be able to work alongside these guys, is they need to prove to them that you have the, that commando mindset. Because the, uh, the, the, the commando beret is the only coveted beret in, in the British military. You have to earn it. It's not a given. And so they have a 10-week a all-arms commando course, which ranges um, everyone from the from the Army. Also the Navy as well, Navy dentists, doctors, that they go do that as well. So unlike other courses where you go in as a, as a private, you, you can on this, you can go in as a private, but you have everything all the way up to senior officers doing this this course with you. Um, but you have, obviously have to earn your Green Beret doing all the commando tests uh, and then prove that you can serve uh, within free commander brigade. So what experiences, do, so so you've now completed this course, you are an army commando. Uh, what experience did you gain from both doing the course and then of course serving as an, a, an army commando in a Royal Marine commando brigade? It was really interesting because I actually, when I was a young guy, when I did my all arms commando course, I won't lie, I didn't really learn much. It was, our instructors were very archaic. It was literally, we were getting beasted all the time, as in like run up and down hills. It's basically who is the fittest of the fittest. We weren't allowed to have any waterproof. You know, it's basically how you, you can survive in the cold. I didn't really learn much from my commando course, but they were testing me physically and mentally. Uh, a lot of the stuff I, I learned was when I actually then went to my unit. But I was fortunate uh, four years later to go back as an instructor myself on the commando course. And I soon realized that things had changed a lot completely. It was all about 
learning as well but still being tested uh, physically uh, as well so from my experience i didn't i didn't learn much i learned i got i gained all that experience when i went to the unit itself but going back as an instructor yeah it was night and day which which i which i um i i thought was good as well so we have we have police academies fire academies ems training schools all over mm-hmm. the world actually and so how do you get the best from a from an individual dean what's your what, what would you suggest well, I, 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 when I did my course, I, I was, I went away with my own perception of instructors. There were some instructors I thought were good. I was, I was literally every course I went on, whether it was the commander course, PTI, the airborne course, the diving course. You know, I was seeing the good and bad out of the instructors, and I was taking all those those good things uh, from them. You know, some people when they they, they they see these military movies and they think and that you've got to scream and shout at the students, but I think if you scream and shout at the students all the time, they're just going to switch off. Um, and so for me, I, I remember being on the, when I was an instructor on the commando course, I always said, lead by example, never ask of them that you can't do your, yourself. And because I'd see that before, I'd see instructors telling people to do stuff and I'd look at them like, you can't do that. And so, you know, for me, it was all about leading by example. But I remember having two instructors on my team, Stuart and Woody, and they would come out every morning and scream and shout at the students, get them in the press up position. like that. And you can almost, the students knew what was coming straight away. Whereas I would come out. And I'd have a joke with them. And I'd, you'd always almost humanize yourself as an instructor because these guys have to remember, these guys are going to be working alongside you uh, one day uh, as well. So you don't want to want, don't want to be uh, annoying them. But then actually when their course did mess up and I did have to punish them, the punishment was tenfold of what the other guys were giving them. Um, and so for me, I, I, I they generally felt like they'd let me down. Uh, they were generally upset. Um, so that was the big distinction between the two, because if you just scream and shout at them, you're not going to get, you want to get the best out of them. And, the, and if you're, they're terrified of coming to you or, or doing something, um, then, that, that, then that's not the approach. But you still maintain those standards. The standards have to be maintained. But it has to also be quite an enjoyable environment. Right. So that that's yeah. yet another soundbite we're going to use as we go forward as well. Yeah. So you're building up your career, you're building up your experience, and obviously you're building up, you know, the, the, the subject matter knowledge of everything. And so next, or maybe we've we're crossed over this, but uh, you become uh, an army diver. And uh, yeah. this is a, this is a, a, pr- a pretty cool course. And uh, as we've discussed off, offline, I've been in a unit that actually had its own dive team. And so to see yeah. what they go through and went through to qualify and certify was impressive but you were the chief diving instructor eventually so what how do you what's an army diver do so an army diver especially in the, in the royal engineers anything we do on the surface we can do subsurface so going into the military i wasn't aware about the divers um but actually of all the the additional uh the specialist qualification you get this is the highest paid because it's, it's the most dangerous and so and so that itself attracts the wrong people on the courses some people go because they want their, the financial benefits so people in the uk are aware of the, the commando course p company for the parachute regiment the dive i'd say the diving course is probably the hardest one out there bar tier one special forces so for us it means that you know should there be we can do everything underwater from concreting, explosives, you know, any hydraulic tools can be used underwater. And and really where this sort of came came to fruition, you know, because for years there was army divers and there's a lot of money going into it. It was actually the the Iraq war, the Optelic in 2003, when the Iraqis ended up sinking a lot of the vessels uh, to stop the... The, the allied forces coming in so the engineers came into their own then they went in they demolished uh the ships they used cutting tools to to break down the vessels they used lifting bags to move them so yeah you literally can do everything anything you do engineering wise on the surface you can do subsurface down to 50 meters excellent our own dive team of course they were shallow water divers and so they had yes. a diving badge with the word sw underneath it and of course when yeah. you're out in the bars what does sw mean well they would tell you it was shark wrestler. So, it was shark wrestler. Shark wrestlers. To, yeah, I used to say smashing wages. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going to go with the shark wrestler. So that's more cool. <laughs> yeah, true. Um, so w- w- we've done that. Now, of course, wh- where are we going to with this for those listening? Of course, Dean has had an amazing amount of experience as we'll, we'll continue to hear. But hopefully we'll have a sec- we're going to have a session in- shortly where we're going to translate all of that into lessons identified, lessons learned. For you out there, whether you're an- at roll call at the police station, whether you're getting ready in the firehouse or, of course, whether you're standing by in the- on the truck and the ambulance. So next up, of course, we you then decide that you want to move onwards and upwards again. 
and it's time to to apply for the British Special Forces. And uh, how does it work? We're, we're familiar with Green Berets, with Delta, with SEAL teams over here. Explain mm. the concept of the British Special Forces and, and, and how you get in. Yeah, so for your listeners, just a, a lot of people don't realise that the Special Forces is actually tiered. Um, so we've talked about the the airborne units, the commando units in UK. They're classed as, as, as tier two special forces. I mean, you have tier one, um, which is the SAS and the SBS. Uh, and here in the US, you know, the Green Berets, the Rangers, the SEALs, they're classed as tier two. And the tier one equivalent is SEAL Team 6 and, and Delta Force. And so for, for the listeners, you know, the big distinction between the two, as I find, is that the, the tier two special forces is... As you see on buds, it's a lot of teamwork. It's a lot of screaming and shouting, sleep deprivation, being able to work together as a team. And that's where you get tested on it in the tier two special forces. The leap to tier one special forces is you need to be self-motivated. There's no one shouting at you. Um, and so you're working more as an individual. You've been able to retain information. The selection process is a lot harder. But the the, the pool, the talent pool tends to come from tier two units anyway and that was the same with me i was seeing a lot of my peers you know my career had taken me to the commando forces i was at airborne so of reconnaissance within that spent eight years within free commander brigade and now as you touched on was the senior diving instructor but in the uk to go sbs you had to be in the royal marines uh and right, so let's just let's, let's just take a second there and special yeah. air service and yeah. special boat service mm -hmm. uh, and and hopefully you'll explain the difference momentarily yeah, so the Special Air Service, um, which is the, the better known of the, of the two units, um, historically wise, um, they basically, they can recruit from all services, whether it's Royal Marines, Army or, or Air Force. Uh, the Special Boat Service was born out of the Royal Marines, and so that's the Naval Special Forces. And so they originally, they only had candidates from the Royal Marines. But unlike here in the, in the US, where you have SEAL Team 6 and Delta Force have their own selection process in the uk it's joint so the sas and sbs do it together there's not one that's easier or harder than the other but the sbs were losing potential candidates from the royal marines because they didn't like diving they didn't like the, di the diving option and so they had an opportunity to go uh to the um to the sas and so they realized actually we're losing potential talent. And then they then decided to open their doors, try service at the time that I decided I was going to go to uh, selection. Right. And so much to the disgust of my friends in the SAS, I did. I volunteered um, for the SBS. And, you know, they tell you to be the gray man on, on selection. A gray man is a person who basically doesn't bring any attention to himself either for good reasons or for, or for bad reasons. You sort of fly under the radar because as the course uh, evolves and the numbers start dropping off, they, they they will get to know you. We started with 200 and we finished with eight. That's normally the pass rate, about 95% uh, attrition. Uh, but for me, because I decided to do this, this non-traditional route, Within two minutes of day one, they called my name out on the parade, and they're like, "What? <laughs> Are you going the SBS?" But oh, that wow. me, you know, I, six months later, I, I passed. I became one of the first guys from the army to the SBS. But now, you know, I think fifteen percent of the SBS come from the army. That's that's excellent. And uh, so you're you're now a tier one special forces operator. You are working not not only diving. Obviously, you, you're doing. Uh, parachute to the, and all mo all modes of mobility in order to get into an operation right yeah well yeah, everyone thinks you know when they look at this special air service and special boat service because it has the word boat in it we think yeah. everything on water actually 97 percent commonality between the two units uh, the only difference is we have the swimmer delivery vehicle which is known as the the seal delivery vehicle here and for the listeners um what they may not know is unlike the us where your counter -ter terrorism is all overseas for us, we do it homeland as well as overseas. And so the big difference between the two units, if there's a hostage situation on uh, an aircraft or in a hotel, uh, the SAS and the SBS come to together, but the command element is led by the SAS. If there's a hostage situation on an oil rig, on a cruise ship, again, both units come together, but the SBS sort of take that lead. So yeah, we train in every, we did all the air insertion, uh, the boat insurgents, the diving, the mobility, mountain training, uh, we we utilize uh, all of them. And during the height of war and terror, SAS were running Iraq and SBS were running Afghanistan. 
And obviously, folk that are listening will relate that to to Delta and other special forces operators in those various theatres of war. So we're going to fast forward a little bit. And so now you are special operator. You're doing a high altitude, high opening, Mm hey-ho, jump, and didn't go quite as planned. No, I was very fortunate when I was in, you know, I joined at the height of the war on terror, you know, the busiest time in Special Forces history. You know, I was fortunate to do the first ever operational jump for the SBS, first ever operational jump for UK Special Forces counterterrorism, you know. So so jumping, I was, I was very comfortable with. And we're about to, we're doing pre-deployment training again for another Afghan tour. We're back in Oman. We do our pre-deployment training in Oman. Uh, because the the terrain and the temperatures are very similar to that of Iraq and Afghanistan. And we every six months you have new guys coming through selection in, into your team, into your uh, squadron. And so we had some young guys who'd never done any hey-ho jumping before. So we all jumped as a squadron, you know, taking those guys through the training. And I was about my third or fourth jump of the day. I can't really remember which one it was. We do so many. And, you know, hey-ho, unlike halo, which is skydiving, uh, where you're free from lines, hey-ho, you're still attached to the aircraft on the static line. And and the purpose of this insertion, you exit the aircraft at 15,000 feet. You're not on oxygen because that's the limits of oxygen. Uh, the air is quite thin. And you tra- the parachute opens and you travel up to 30 uh, minutes in the air or 50 kilometers to the target area. So I jumped out. Um, I did my compulsory count and... Uh, I looked at, as I was looking, I was then realized I was looking the wrong way. I was looking up at my foot, which was caught in a line above my head. And so I'm trying to clear my leg in time before this static line opens the parachute. I couldn't clear it in time and my leg got pulled over my head and to the right. Thankfully, my heel did clear from the line. And straight away, the pain, it was nothing I felt like before. I was drifting in and out of consciousness because the air was still quite thin and vomiting uh, because of the amount of pain. But I could still see the rest of my team, and I I carried on flying the parachute. Uh, Landed it one-legged. It was a good landing. Um, But unfortunately, the damage sustained uh, ended my career after 16 years. I tore my ACL, my MCL, my lateral meniscus in my knee, my hamstring, my calf, and my quadricep. And so I was told, you know, thank you for your service. It's uh, it's time to go. Were you able to walk off the DZ with all of that? Um, I, I I got obviously um, a guy under each arm to sort of hobble me off off yeah. the deep head into the Land Rover. We went to the MRI, um, at the hospital, and yeah, had the bad news from there. The, the, to add, you know, the the issue we then had is obviously we realised that I, I had all these these issues in my leg, but it was the same time as the Icelandic volcano eruption, which had grounded all aircraft, and so. I had to wait four weeks before they could get a flight in for me to get me uh, back home. So oh, wow. the normal sort of procedure was get you in, get you into surgery and get you recovering as, as quick as possible. But literally I was just in a, in a hotel in Muscat on, on painkillers sort of deteriorating. So yeah, that didn't help matters. So again, I'm going to try and relate this back now to a, a lot of our public safety, public sector folk here in the US. Of course, uh, we have injuries, we have line of duty issues, we have people whose careers abruptly come to an end. Yeah. And for you, I think, uh, Dean, this marked almost the end of a chapter and therefore time to to get well and yeah. to move on. I mean, how did that make you feel when when something clearly you love doing Mm. Has, is is has ended or is ending? Yeah, like like I said, I had no any no aspirations of leaving the military at all. I was a lifer. I would be in now until I'm 55. You know, I didn't. I re- reached the pinnacle in my career and in my life. I just met my wife as well. You know, so everything was going good, and all of a sudden this this curveball out of nowhere yeah. that happened, and so. For me, I went through what was known as an identity crisis, and it's not just in the special forces; it could be in in, in anything in, in law enforcement, fire, you know, uh, uh, EMTs. You know, you 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 train your whole of your life to be the best that you can be, uh, and then all all of a sudden, this this injury changes direction and 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 your and your path. And so, for me, I wasn't prepared for it. Um, you know, I'd gone from working in a, a tight knit unit with like minded individuals who had the same drive and passion, um, knowing what I was doing for the next two years. Literally, they they have the next two years planned out to now. Where do I fit in society? What is my role? You know, <clears throat> I'd lost my identity. I got to where I had in the special forces due to my physical robustness. And now here I am now, I can't even run 100 meters without my knee giving way. You know, mums before were brief- briefing the prime minister on hostage rescue. Now no one even knows who you are. But thankfully for me, my wife um, 
picked up that role of the military. Um, you know, she's very entrepreneurial and she, you know, I was in a dark place. And then to add to the pressure as well for the listeners, you know, when I got, when I got out of the military, my wife was eight months pregnant. So for me, not only did I have to deal with the injury, I had to also deal with the fact that I need to now have a new career. Is there going to be any work out there? Am I going to be able to support my, my new family? So, but my wife, as I said, very entrepreneurial. She set up my our first security company on her phone. Um, <laughs> you know, she worked in the finance sector, uh, has been working since uh, a very young age. And so stuff that was new to me that I didn't understand, because I've been in since the age of 17 to 33. I don't know who to get in contact with at the bank or the council and, and things like that. The military is like your mother and your father. They clothe you, they feed you, they pay you on time. And they sort of take away some of those distractions. Uh, so you can focus on your job. So thankfully, my wife was there to 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 take that role from them. Interest. Another interesting point, Dean. I mean, we've been having conversations out here in in public safety land of you know where people have eminently great education, but they can't balance a checkbook. And there's a yeah. thing that we're missing there about how to do personal administration. And yeah. uh, hopefully, that's something we can we can major on. Uh, you were on Jocko Willink the other day, and he talked about the fact at this point you have to find a new mission. And I think, uh, you know, you, you went off and did did the private security stuff. And also, I think, th- thanks to the, the the involvement of your wife, you also got got got, got on your bike, literally. But let's talk about the sort of you, you went into into private security first. And that was yeah. obviously a, a, a good transition for you, I would imagine. It's, it's a natural transition, you know, yeah. you know, sounding like Liam Neeson, you know, with these particular skill sets, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's yeah. a natural transition to go to. Um, and, and for me, you know, a lot of my friends at this time, so I got out in May 2011, which was a, the Arab Spring was now kicking off in the Middle East and North Africa. A lot of my friends were um, doing a, uh, anti-piracy off the East Coast of Somalia. That's That was at its height. So I didn't want to be competing with them. Um uh, other guys were doing six weeks rotations in Afghan and Iraq on the oil and gas. So for me, I then realized that actually corporate close protection and corporate protection was where the money was at. So in the security industry, uh, the risk ratio balance is, is offset. You know, you could be earning twice as much in a five star hotel in Rio de Janeiro than you would be out in, in Afghanistan. So I was that. Well, let, let's focus on that. But my first job within 48 hours is to help set up the British Embassy in Benghazi during the Arab Spring. Uh, so the Prime Minister launched something called Department for Institute Development. Um, and this was his, his, his first run out. So he wanted that to be a success. So I'm in Benghazi with all these security companies, oil and gas NGOs, media. Gaddafi's now in Tripoli. You know, the city's surrounded. And I, I was listening to these security companies. I always call them the big five. And, you know, these guys were charging six, seven figure sums for crisis management and evacuation plans, which weren't actually in place. And I've seen, and I've got plenty of examples through the years of this still being the case. And so for me, I wanted to find a niche with the industry. So I wanted to focus on that. You know, we do evacuations a lot in the special forces and all the planning. And so I, I bought um, I bought 30 weapons on the black market and I buried them between Tunis and Egypt. And I designed my own evacuation plans. I buried communications kits, money, um, because to me, I understood that the Libyans didn't want this to be another Af- Afghanistan and Iraq. You know, once Gaddafi had fallen, yeah. the, 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 the weapons would be off the street. And so for me, it was being able to, you know, be able to come in uh, across the borders. And then if we needed the weapons, at least I knew where they, where they were. We lived in Aberdeen. So Aberdeen, for your listeners, is like the oil and gas capital of Europe. It's like the Houston uh, right. of Europe. And so we had, I had access to the oil and gas companies, and there's plenty of them in Libya. And I sold... I sold my uh, evacuation um, plans uh, to them and just sat on them, never needed them. But then in a short period of time, every time I got a phone call, it was a different task. It was a different mission. It was somewhere else in the world. Was, you know, when you tell people in the security industry, but the way you look, they think you're a doorman from the local nightclub. You know, right. you know, security industry is very diverse. You know, nowadays you have maritime security, you have cyber, you have surveillance, coaching or mentoring, crisis management. It, it's, it's, so, it's so big. And so... I was learning a lot in a short period of time. Each phone call, I was going to a new place, a new mission, and really built up a, a huge network ar- around the world. And then September 11, 2012, when your American ambassador got killed um, in Benghazi, they made a movie called 13 Hours. Um, I, I was there that evening. I actually just finished the London Olympics, six weeks in London doing the Olympics, which was great. And uh, now I'm in Benghazi and it's all now kicking off. And so I was tasked to get a a German oil company from Benghazi back to Tripoli. So I did that through safe houses that I had in in the desert. 
And then because of the success of that, two years later, um, I was at the Brazil Soccer World Cup or Football World Cup, depends where you come from. And um, It'll always be football to me, mate. It'll always be know. football, yeah. <laughs> okay, that's perfect. And yeah. um, again, I, I get a phone call uh, from the Canadian embassy stuck and they said, look, your name keeps coming up. And so went back in and single-handedly evacuated the Canadian embassy, 18 military and four diplomats. So in that period of time, I then built up a reputation within the security industry as the guy to go to for evacuations and crisis. So, and is that something, dare I ask, you're still doing today? Or are you? Yeah, but, yeah very you? much. I, I, I do. Yeah. A lot of people um, think, you know, because they see what I do on, you know, social media with the books, yeah, the speaking, right. and they, they think that's what you're doing. And, and that's 30% of what I'm doing. So, yeah, we ended up getting involved. We ended up helping with the Afghan pullout, helping getting over a thousand out. And then more recently, um, which caught people by surprise, October the 7th with the Hamas attack. I was in Disneyland with my wife, October the 8th, I was on a flight into Israel. And then I popped up on Jocko's, Sean Ryan's, Jack Ryan, Jack yep. Card podcast um, and went in there and we got over 200 uh, people out of, of Israel. And that caught a lot of people out because they're like, I didn't think you were in this industry anymore. I just never left. Uh, we never left. You know, So we don't, we don't have a website, uh, me and my wife. We just literally just put the right teams behind the scenes on the ground. Wonderful. And it's all about, as you said already, the right teams. Let's yeah. get down to literally uh, the, the tip of South America. Um, oh. And uh, you are on your bike. What's going on? Yeah, so after the Canadian Embassy evacuation, which I mentioned, my normal SOP, me and my wife are business partners, my normal SOP would be I charge my phone, launder my clothes, and get ready for the next phone call. And that year, I, you know, during that year, I lost my father. I buried my father literally the day after I'm, I'm on a flight. I'd, I'd lit, I was home. My wife sat me down with two bottles of wine, and we had a long discussion through the night. The chapter 16 in my book is called Dead or Divorced. And this is what we, we were chatting about. She highlighted to me I'd only been home 21 days in a 365-day calendar. And so for me, I was trying to match that adrenaline rush that I had when I was in the Special Forces without actually coming to terms with the fact that I'd, I'd left. But also... Communication wise, my wife thought that I wanted to be away on the ground because I enjoyed it. And I thought she wanted me to be away because we, you know, helping build up the business. And so we soon realized that you know, that wasn't the case. So we I we took a sabbatical from the secure industry. My wife was also doing property developing, very successful. And this is five years now, having left the military. And my injured leg now was two kilos or five pounds lighter than my good leg because of the muscle wastage. And so I'd neglected my own physical and mental well-being because I've been so fixated on just, just the work. And I bought a, a push bike off Amazon, a, a road bike. And our office in Aberdeen was about eight miles away, just cycled to and from the office. But being physically active again, getting the lungs going, I just felt like there was a, a huge weight off my shoulders. But you can imagine when my backstory sat in these meetings with these architects and planners, that we actually had our second uh, child, Tommy, at this point. And I'm sat there in the corner with a bottle feeding him uh, and Alana's doing all the work. And she said, right, you need to do something. And so we also do a lot in the nonprofit area, the philanthropy area. And so I said, Look, I fancy doing a, uh, a world record. And my wife said, well, what in? I said, well, it had to be a sport that my injury wasn't going to be um, an issue. I said, well, cycling seems to be good. And so my wife then found the world's longest road, which runs from southern Argentina to northern Alaska. It's 14,000 miles through 14 countries over two continents. And, 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 you know, because of the curvature of the earth, it's the equivalent of cycling from London to Sydney and then another 4,000 miles. People don't really understand yeah, that. So for me, I'd only cycle less than 20 miles. It sounds quite arrogant. And I applied for the world record. I said, yeah, let's go for that one at the age of 40. Um and the world record was 126 days at the time. Six weeks later, Guinness came back and said you've been successful on the application. How did you convince them? Obviously, there's a pitch involved here at some, at some point. And so they go, hang on, you've only done 20 miles. But, of course, you've done all this other stuff. I mean, well, yeah. how, how do you pitch it? It is. You know, a lot of people think, oh, anyone can apply for the world record. It's not. It is actually a, a pitch in itself. So for me, yes, I had that special forces background. So I knew physically and mentally I had that capacity. But it was also the the message or the campaign you're doing. You know, if you a lot if you were you put a fundraising effort behind it. So so I'd reached out to a good friend of mine who's an ex a member of the royal family who I met in the military. And him and I had done a lot, you know, Prince Harry's, him and I had done a lot together in non-profit area before. 
And so I told him about this challenge that I was looking at doing. And he was, him and his brother and Kate were about to launch a campaign called Heads Together, which focused on mental health throughout veterans, you know, emergency responders, young children, teenagers, postnatal depression. And so that helped, you know, I put that on the pitch, you know, this is what we're looking to do. And so that, that obviously helped them or convinced. I probably thought, I probably, they probably thought, yeah, we'll give this guy a chance. He's only cycled 20 miles. He's probably not going to do it, but yeah, they came back and said, you've been successful. And so, so we had the challenge and we now had the campaign that we were going to do it for. Excellent. And we should just mention the fact that uh, when you were a special boat service operator, you did uh, the joint terminal attack course. At, at, yes. at, 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 what is the technical term here? So uh, FAC. Forward air controller. There we go. Forward with, air controller, with, yeah. With, 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 with Harry when, of course, he was a soldier. And uh, people forget yeah. that he served for 10 years uh, in the British Army. And so yeah. uh, you were you were a classmate. Yeah, yeah. I, I turned up on this course and, you know, they have four SF guys on each course. Uh, there's only 18 students and it's a little wooden hut, you know, in RAF Lehman in North Yorkshire, a little wooden hut right at the end of the runway. So the the Air Force, the Typhoon pilots, the, sorry, the Eurofighter pilots and the Tornado pilots pay no attention to you. But this day that I turned up for the on day one, there was a lot of there's a lot of brass, as we say, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of senior officers around, which was strange. I and mean, then I realized when I went in the room, he was sat in front of me uh, who it was. And so. You know, he, you know, everyone got their FaceTime with him. He left the room and, and the chief instructor and the course officer said, look, you know, you know who's on the course. He gets no preferential treatment. You treat him like one of your own. I was like, perfect. So he comes back in the room and the first lecture is on call signs. So on the course, you're called jackpot one to jackpot one eight. So the the the, the uh, instructor in the jet knows which student he, he's talking to. But when you go to your units, you get your own call sign. So in the SBS, we're known as Mayhem. So I was always Mayhem 4-3. You know, SAS is Widowmaker. So Harry puts his hand up and said, if I'm successful on this course, do I get a call sign? And I just <laughs> blurted out. I said, yeah, you're Fox Piss 1 um, because of his ginger <laughs> hair. And of course, you could see the course officer and chief instructor's face just drop, their jaw drop. Harry looked round, saw my beret, smiled. I mean, that was it. The course officers like you two are paired off because he knew that I would treat him like any other officer or yes. any of any other soldier. I, I wasn't I wasn't phased by who he was and, and and his background. You know, he was 23 years years old. He's a young second lieutenant. And yeah, we we just hit it off, you know, because he can see through that. You know, he gets that all the all, all the time. And so oh. yeah, we've been friends ever since. So fast forward then. So he's going to be either a sponsor or a supporter or a patron of the of, of the race or the the the, the event. That yeah. So that, do so. Yeah. So you had and and of course someone's getting married. There's a wedding invitation. Yeah. You have to get to Alaska within a certain amount of time. No mm. pressure going on here. Yeah. Well, I didn't know about that when I set off. You know, the wheel record was a uh, hundred seventeen days. I was aiming for hundred and ten days. And actually, I did the opposite of all the other previous record holders. They started in the north finished in the South. But when I spoke to them, all their issues were in South and Central America. So from a military planning perspective, I was like, well, why didn't you address those issues early, get them out of the way? And so that's what I did. I went from South to North. Um, and that worked in my advantage from a uh, cycling perspective. I had nice tailwinds as well once I got out of Argentina, which was quite hard. And I took 10 days off the South America world record. Um, I got into North America on day 70. And I was 14 days ahead of the world record. So for me, I'm like, perfect. You know, hopefully having spoken to the previous record holders, all those issues should now be behind us. Um, and then my wife, who's the campaign director, she runs everything. She she fundraised. She got me sponsorship. You know, she, she very much keeps distractions away from me uh, so I can focus on what I'm doing. And I had five missed calls within an hour of getting into Del Rio in Texas. And so I automatically we had two children. I assumed there was something wrong with our kids. And she rang me and told me we were kindly invited to Harry and Meghan's wedding, the royal wedding. I was like, oh, that's, that's nice. And she goes, no, no, you, you need to be finished now by day 102. So going into the phone call, I was 14 days ahead of the world record. Ten minutes later, I'm now a day behind. Um, <laughs> I had to change the, the way that I cycled in North America and I did in, in South America. But, you know, for the law enforcement here in South America, we, we you know, because of security reasons, we ha I had to be off the road at night. Uh, for obvious reasons, yeah. uh, coming into North America, you know, had the luxury of of the of the law enforcement, so I could I could cycle at night. So I, I got stopped a few times, about two o'clock, three in the morning, from some of the highway patrol. On what the hell am I doing <laughs> on the on the highway? 
There you go. So if you're a state trooper and you stopped a bald man on a bicycle who told you he was going from Argentina to Alaska, he really was, and here he is now, troopers. So uh, yeah. that's, I'll send you a that's... photo. I, I do have a photo. <laughs> Oh, cool. And you obviously broke the world record, got the Guinness records and mm. got, got to have a piece of wedding cake as well. Yeah, I, I got back. Um, you know, I, I, I managed to uh, get a week outside and I fin- I completed America. I had 17, and a, 17 days for North America. I did it in 11 and a half days. And uh, actually, you know, about a week outside in a town called Whitehorse. And then I, I, I'm on social media and someone shares a post about a, a professional cyclist um, who's sponsored by Red Bull, all the brands. He does this for a living, who come out on social media and said he wanted to be the first person to do it under 100 days. So for me, I could have quite happily just carried on at the pace I was, I was at and come in. But for me, I wanted to, I wouldn't have been comfortable with myself if I hadn't pushed myself as much as I could. And so I, I, I cycle for... Um, um 28 hours in the last 36 hours to come in in 99 days 12 hours and 56 minutes um so it wasn't the original plan when we set off you know i didn't know about this guy i didn't know about the royal wedding so for me the the the, the success of this project was being reactive to the situation changes on the ground which your listeners will be fully aware of when you go into some of these situations you don't know what to expect you're trained for a certain amount yep. but you have to react to those and that was the success of this. even to the very last day i was having to change the way that i um uh the, the plan great so in the, the the second section of this and we'll take a sort of a short break in a second but uh you've just done this challenge how what mindset do you have how do you maintain that focus obviously this is an endurance event but yeah. where is your headspace when all this, when you're just going from you know days days and days and days and days on the bike heading north? Um, yeah. Where where's your mind where all this is going on? What are, what are you focusing on? What are you thinking about? So your mind goes everywhere, really. You know, for me, you always have your start point and and, and your objective. Um, the first week, so as I said, we, the world record was 117 days. I was aiming for 110 days, and it wasn't because I wanted to smash it by a week. You know, one of the things we have in the military is called fudge. So I'd looked at all the potential scenarios and situations that could happen, and there was potential contingencies. But when it came to natural disasters, coups, third party influence, actually four weeks of cy- after cycling through Nicaragua, I'd just missed a coup by four weeks. Um, and so <laughs> if we encountered any of them, it was going to eat into the, into that. By the end of my first week, I was 39 miles behind target because the winds were so strong, but my target was still a, a, a week ahead of the world record. And from that point on, I was hitting my targets for the day I was and um, my objectives and even more. And so for me, I was never really behind target, which mentally put me in a good a good headspace uh, yeah. going forward. The you know, other people that do challenges like as the professional guys, they tend to have a, a team that plan it and then they just focus on what they need to do. Me and my wife were planning it together. So as well as I'm cycling, I'm also thinking about the next two or three stages uh, uh, ahead. So that kept me busy. And then if I ever was in it, you know, I had music on my um, in my uh, in my ears as well if I needed it. But I also was, had fortune to go visit some of the charities. There was 11 charities that were going to be beneficiaries of this. And, and one of them, for example, was, uh, was called Place to Be. A young a a, a a a children's charity in school, and they knew that the hundred thousand pounds that they would get donated enabled fourteen thousand children to speak to psychologists. So I just related that to miles. Every mile I'm on this bike helps a child. But again, easing my mind, I see people going out on challenges, and they're like, "I'm, I'm ten miles behind today, but what I'll do is I'll, I'll catch that up tomorrow." But you don't know what's going to happen the next day. You could have another bad day, and then I'll be twenty, thirty miles behind. And so if that's the case, you're going to bed at night in the wrong headspace, knowing you're behind the curve. So whatever I did, I made sure that I was always on target or or ahead of target. And so for me, there's never any doubt creeping in at all. Dean, I want to do a kind of a quick fire round for this yes. segment, if we can. And I'm going to just throw a heading at you and just interpret it for me. So you've kind of started off already. We just talked about where the headspace is. So that's, yeah. so that's a kind of endurance thing, right? What's your view on leadership? What makes a good leader? What makes a bad leader? How can we how can we become better leaders? Uh, what makes a good leader? A good leader is someone who can manage their own ego. They don't think they're the best person in the room. You know, a good leader is someone who respects his team and understands that everyone's unique in that team, even from the youngest guy in Gill uh, to the, to the eldest and most experienced. Because you don't know what their experiences 
uh, before they, they've come to you. So one thing we do in the special forces, when we're planning operations, the team leader will plan the operation, but everyone in the team gets a, an opportunity to talk and, and probe and, and pen test it as well. Because, you know, like I said, the youngest guy may have done an operation with another unit, which actually is, is relevant to, to what you're doing. So I, I'd say with, with a leader, listen to your team. Um, there, there's a great one that um, I think it's Amazon that do. You know, you, you go into board meetings, and normally when people have board meetings, they get the they understand they understand what they're going to be talking about prior. So already they're 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 making their own decisions what they're going to say in in the room. But what they do with, with Amazon is actually the papers turned down, and so they don't know what they're going to talk about. And then literally they get they turn it over. And they have 20 minutes to read and actually get their natural thoughts. Um, but the, the 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 chair of the board meeting is the last person to talk because some people can be influenced by the leader and say and think, oh yeah, he's he's got the right, he's, he has more experience. But he lets them go around the, the room and then they're the last one to talk. And I think that's a great idea because actually your plan might not even even be the best one and you can get information from them. So that's why I say as a good leader, don't manage your ego and listen to your team. A bad leader is the opposite of that. <laughs> one who thinks his ego, they know everything and everyone else should, should listen to, the, to them. So I'm a graduate of the British Army Staff College and we were taught that uh, tactics is no longer the opinion of the senior officer present. Mm. So you've tier one type of question, right? Maintaining that situational awareness in anything and everything that you do. How do you maintain situational awareness in, in any environment? I think for me, as a lesson I learned actually in, in Afghanistan, I misread a situation. Um, I thought I was in a dangerous situation. I was about to do something which would, you know, potentially would, would, would be bad. Um, and, and maybe probably put some more dialogue on it and explain it more and then it will go into the situation where so i we used to dress up as taliban and pick up taliban agents um so dress up as, as the locals and uh, each day we would go out and, and pick up these agents uh we're dressed as taliban we're in the vehicle we have a um an afghan with us i was in the lead vehicle we have a second vehicle which picks up the agent we have a third vehicle um which picks up any sort of surveillance and and follow-up and so each day we were going to Kandahar. There's no point in planning a route because it, there's roadblocks all the time. And um, but I, we used to, you know, I had my dark beard. We used to have makeup turbans a lot. But I, I never used to, you know, you can change your eyebrows. But I, I never like anything in my eyes, contact lenses, contact lenses. And so I had piercing blue eyes, this brown skin, black beard. And it, for me, it, it really stood out. And this one day, uh, the traffic had blocked and we were directed down this smaller street. And there was market, there's shop stores either side. It was a narrow street, but it was bumper to bumper with traffic. And people were knocking on the window and pointing. So straight away, my my senses were heightened because I knew that I shouldn't be in that area. Um, and I thought I'd been compromised. And I spoke to my, my terp interpreter from the SF and he agreed with me. And so in my earpiece, the, the command had heard what was going on and they, they were like, you, you're, you happy with immediate action drill? The immediate action drill was to grab an MP5 Kurtz from under my, my seat as a, a 30, 30 round magazine of nine millimeter. And you just empty full automatic the, uh, into the windscreen to give yourself some time and distance between you and the, and the, uh, the enemy. You grab your weapon, which is wrapped in a rag you run to the back of the vehicle and it's it's like an RPG. It's a law light anti-tank weapon and you blow up the vehicle so that anyone who gets that vehicle has no access to the communication kits. And then you are then on your flip-flops doing um, escaping and evading 17 miles back to Kanda. So in my head, this is all going on. I have visions of me being on CNN that night in an orange boiler suit. Um, but I, you know, the good thing about the tier one special forces is, no one will override your decision. You know, my in my command in my ear was like, it's your decision, you do what you need to do because he can't see what I see. And so as I go to grab my weapon, or during this whole period as well, the vehicles are slowly moving forward. As I go to grab it, the second vehicle behind me pulls around the corner and my friend shouts across the net. He's like, stop, stop, stop. So straight away, I, I dropped the weapon, put it on the floor and put my hands back on the steering wheel. He said, your turbine's caught in the door. So for me... I'd misread a situation. Oh. I thought everyone was bad 
because of where I was. Um, we've been compromised when, in fact, people were being generous, being nice, just to let me know my turban had caught the door. So my question back to you, yeah, so back to your situation awareness, yeah. I've learned so much from that. And what I say is when I go into a situation now, rather than just run in and, you know, because you're quickly in a short period of time, you're analyzing what you see and trying to make a decision. I always always say, just give yourself that extra couple of seconds, you no know, breathe, because as you know, what you initially think, I mean, actually what actually is happening is two different things. Um, but trust your, trust your gut. So, and it's sort of allied to, again, something we were talking about before we started recording. And I think this is a, this is a Britishism more than anything else. But uh, you're in a situation, and this could be a cop going into uh, an unsafe area, reading the atmospherics of a situation. You know, what things make the hair stand up on the back of your neck and you go, oh, something's untoward here. Probably subtly different to situation awareness, but just the whole kind of environment. How do you, re- how do you read a situation? How do you read the environment? I think you. I think you almost have that sixth sense. It's your. It's your gut. You know, we used to do it in the special forces. If you felt exposed, if you felt, oh, I don't feel comfortable in this fire position, where we're, then it's probably because you're not in the in the right fire position. Yeah. You're not in the right place. So, so for me, if you get that hair on your neck and and then you think, you know, there's something untoward. You know, again, I depend on the situation. Wait, wait for that backup as well. But there are situations that we've had to do in tier one where. You know it's bad, but you just have to lean in and just go go straight through the door. But me, I, I tend to go with my gut. If, it, if something feels wrong, then it probably is wrong. Teamwork and teams. You've been a man in very special teams. What's yeah. the essence of a team? How do you keep a team together? How do you keep your team motivated? Uh, I think with a team, everyone needs to be involved. You know, going back to that leadership. You no, know, whether the, the new guy who's just come off selection, it doesn't matter. You know, everyone has a role and, and responsibility. And and what we do in the in the in the military, as you know, you always train two up. So if you, if you're a corporal, you know the color sergeant's job uh, as well. So have everyone involved in the team. Have a sense of humor. <laughs> you know, one of the ethos of special forces is is humor and humility. Um, so for me, it's just keeping those. Just make sure everyone feels special within the team because everyone is, everyone is special within the team. Everyone has uh, a role. And and generally, if people need you know give them praise, I'm not saying praise them all the time, but if they did something. Then, then let them let them know they're done well. You know, one of the things we used to do in the special forces is called a hot debrief. Uh, you know, what worked, and it was three simple questions: what worked, what didn't work, and what we were going to do differently uh, for next time. And that's what we used to do with the team. And and everyone, everyone's human. Everyone will make mistakes. You know, even you know, as a, again, as a bad leader, a bad leader will jump on someone who's made a mistake. We're forgetting actually, you were in that position once before uh, as well. So for a good team, you have to have that sense of humor and everyone want to be part of part of that team. And for me, a lot of people talk about maybe sometimes is, is my confidence. Um, you know, my, my, we used to get, you know, them confidential reports from the military. Oh, yeah. yeah. Your annual reports. My, my troop, my troop commander used to write, there's a fine line between confidence and arrogance, you know, with me on all of them. But for me, it was like, well, you have to be confident because if you're not, not confident, then the rest of the team's not confident as well. You know, if you're, if you're nervous or, you're feeling scared that 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 washes off on on them so you know the way that you act will will wash off on your team indeed i mean that that i i've always said and this may well get bleeped out but there's a fine line between asset and asshole right and so you have to you have to to be careful there Um, so we talked about so you mentioned humor that was on my list so we'll, we'll take that as covered and obviously you know Public safety around the world, like the military around the world, thrive on humour as a coping mechanism. Some people may disagree with that. I'm I'm in the in the school of we actually need to need that as a as a relief. I don't know what you think about that. No, I believe you know you know same with with your listeners. You know the roles that they're doing. Um, you know roles with the SF. You, you end up in dark places, and so yeah. Sometimes when in a, a dark play, and I've been in situations that have been dark. I mean, when all of a sudden one of the lads will just pull out a one liner and it just changes, changes the, the morale. Um, but yeah, I think you have to have a, um, a sense of humor either for those situations or because if you don't have a sense of humor, it, you know, that you are going to be tested in, in dark places. Um, yeah. you know, in the military, you know, you think you've finished an operation, like actually you're staying on the ground for another two weeks. If you, if you have a sense of humor failure, yeah, it, it, you know, you're going to, you're going to struggle. So, um, yeah, be 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 confident, be able to laugh laugh at yourself and and laugh at the situation that you're in. Absolutely, laugh at yourself and with others. Mm. Um, family, you clearly have a great support network around mm. you, but uh, 
the importance of family and the importance of keeping, let's just say, on the good side of your family, because, of course, special forces, public safety, you're out there, you know, in a in a you know team that isn't the home team. And so when yeah. you get home, what's your best advice? So for me, yeah, I, you know, you know, the, the emergency uh emergency services, the, the special forces, the military, it's quite a selfish job because you go away and you and your your other half's at home uh, picking uh, looking after every everything. So f- for me, what I've done, you know, when I left the special forces, I, I spent a lot of time looking for the team that I, I could match when I was in special forces. When re- not out realizing it was underneath my nose, the team that I had is, is, is my family. And right. my wife, you know, very much same mindset as uh, the special forces and, and pushes me. So for me, it's all about First thing is communication. Always, always talk to each other. Um, don't do anything that's, that's going to rock the boat. So for me now, you know, I talked about earlier on, I'd only been home 21 days in a 365-day calendar. So we had the yin and yang balance completely wrong. Now I don't go out the door unless it's been green lit by my wife uh, and the kids. So my wife bought me the ticket. She actually bought a ticket for me to fly to Israel before I'd even known it. So for me, I that makes me feel at ease because I know that, when I'm on the ground, I don't have to worry about my family. They're fully aware of why I'm here and what I'm doing. So for me, it's all about communication. The team doesn't just end when, you, when you're in work. You, you have a, a bigger and more important team at home. Wonderful. And uh, the thing that uh, we're spending a lot of time focusing on, certainly in public safety here in the US, um, dealing with stress and creating resilience and resilience networks. I mean, you've been in some tough situations over your time. How do you cope with stress and, you know, what what are your recovery mechanisms? So coping with stress for me, um, you know, when I did the bike ride, you know, it was for a mental health campaign and I was asked, what is the message you're trying to promote with this challenge? And so for me, it was physical activity helped my mental state, you know. So there's, there's three ways of dealing with stress and, and, and mental health. You know, one is communication, which I think is key. You know, talk to talk to people. You know, whether it's not in work, talk to people at home. That's why my 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 go to is, is is my wife. Um, the other one is medication, which you know, I we try to avoid. But the other one is physical activity. So just find out what what makes you happy. I know that my wife knows if I'm grumpy, grumpy sod, she just tells me to go to the gym. You know, I just know I need to sort of blow it off. Um, so for me, find out what is your. You know, yours may just be you want to go for a walk or just go sit in the beach. You know, find out what what your coping mechanisms are and make sure you, you you do them. But the key ones for me is physical activity and, and communication. You know, mental health's changed. Uh, it used to be a taboo uh, in, in the past. And now, now it's very much, it's very much important. Um, so yeah, sort of look at those resources that are available to, and then there are there helplines as there's, there's groups that you can chat to. Great. So just a reminder, I'm talking to Dean Stott. Uh, just for those of you joined halfway through, I'm Rob Lawrence. I'm the Police One contributor, EMS One presenter, and uh, former British soldier and army officer, but not quite to the standard that uh, Dean was once. But uh, uh, So let's come right up to date. So many people would have seen you now on Netflix, uh, the new Netflix show, Toughest Forces on Earth. You worked in Jordan, and I've got them listed here. I'm not, I haven't memorised them. Jordan, Colombia, Sweden, Malaya, Mexico, Philippines, Austria, and actually in the US with the yeah. EOD and so tell us uh, about the show Dean yeah so the, the show is, is uh, if you, you may know Top Gear uh, it's like Top Gear with guns but we can't call it Top Guns uh, that's already already gone <laughs> but the the, 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 the the premises of the show is free hosts um, myself there's myself from the UK there's a Navy SEAL called so are you like the Jeremy Clarkson of the show then I, I am the Jeremy Clarkson I, I, good I'm, I'm not an actor uh, at all and you know myself and the production would, would, would clash heads because they they understand TVs you know there's a fine line between authenticity and entertainment right. whereas for me it has to be fully authentic you know the entertainment can come later but yeah the premise of the show is we go around the world we visit eight special forces units and we showcase what's unique about that unit um, you know whether it's geographically where they're placed what the threats are to them or uh, uh, as, a, as a nation or ge- or environmental wise you know we, we went to the arctic with the with the swedes the alpines with the austrians you know we're in the, in the jungles of of, of colombia and, and malaysia and and then also you know what is it their, their skill sets are what do they specialize in what specialist equipment weapon systems uh, that they use 
So we, we go in there and we do about a week of training with them. Um, and then the final, they do a final mission uh, profile. So for us, it's really showcasing some of these units. Cause I, before I did a show, I wasn't aware of all these units around the world. You know, for me, um, I knew about the SES, the SBS, SEAL Team 6 and Delta Force because they were the guys that I worked with. I wasn't aware about all these units and also the influence that both UK and US have on them and their training. So their training is very similar to ours. So tell us about your two uh, counterparts that were with you as well. Yeah, so I got a phone call for the show over three years ago. Um, actually, the, the the bike ride I did, Prince Harry and I did a promo video together back in Kensington Palace. And one of the ladies that was working on that uh, production team was now working with this new production team and they said oh we're doing it there's a show called inside world's toughest prisons i think it's seven seasons now on netflix um it's the same production team from uk and they wanted to do something around the forces so she remembered me spoke to my wife and about three years ago during covid and said this is this is what we want to do so they went from 150 candidates in uk down to me as the final one and i said well that doesn't really make any sense because i hadn't done any tv at the time and and there were other tv stars on yeah. it I said, well no no dean looks like he's the fittest and i was like so what <laughs> is the show about am i doing selection eight times over and but then netflix us were like no we wanted an american and so we then had to fly to Dallas and we did a, what was called a chemistry test. There was a few American veterans there. We did a bit of PT together, had a barbecue, socialize, see what we're like in front of the camera. And then I met a guy there called Ryan Bates, who's an ex-Navy SEAL. Uh, he, he's a bubbly character, as you'll see on the show. He's always yep. joking around uh, and things like that. So he he brought that sort of humor, which we talked about earlier on, yep. uh, to the show. And then right at the 11th hour, the... Um, the, the commissioner for this commissioned Top Gear back in 2005 and said, two doesn't work. We need three. We need like a full guy. And so we were then introduced to a couple of YouTubers, which to me is a whole new world. Um, and yeah. there was a young guy called Cameron Thaff, ex-ranger, did four years. Uh, and he specializes, his YouTube is based around military equipment. Oh, right. And yeah, so... So this guy is there with his little nose ring in. He's got his hairs all nice. And I'm like, are you, you, is this for Pop Idol? Or is this for Toughest Forces on Earth? And <laughs> for me, I didn't think I didn't think this was going to work. But actually, now you've seen the final product. It yeah. works really well. You have three very different characters uh, bring their different experiences uh, to it. But as you said, I'm the, I'm the Jeremy Clarkson, and I just stuck to my stuck to my narrative. Excellent. I just have to say that uh, I think it was in Sweden and and going back to my military day, we probably did the same exercise, exercise hard for where you go to Norway, you do your Arctic warfare training and they cut a big hole in the ice and you have all your pack on and your skis and you ski up and you ski in and certain low hanging parts of your anatomy end up just about here in your throat. And so I, I lived that one too. And uh, when you guys did it, I, you know, oh boy, that's uh, yeah, it's, it's an, yeah. something you never, ever forget. No, well, I was very fortunate between the commandos. We used to go to Norway every year. Right. Yeah. And, and so I was fortunate to do my Arctic warfare instructors. I was a military ski instructor. You know, I'd done the icebreaker drill as a student, but also then as an instructor, whereas my two co my two co-hosts, you know, Ryan had been to Alaska, but never been on skis and, right. and Cameron, everything we were doing was was new to Cameron. Everything I was doing, I, I'd done I'd done before. Right. Which, which was good, uh, which was good. So that's why I went first, because I could see that they these guys were nervous. And they, yeah. they so I go in and we have a thing in the UK military about being non-emotional. I went in, I just did the, the non-emotion because I didn't want them being worried because they knew that I'd done this before. And there, if there was any sort of, again, any fear or or nervousness, you or, or wash off on them. But uh, yeah, I ended up doing all that. I didn't think I was going to do it at the age of 47. I thought those <laughs> days were over, but um, clearly yeah. not. I must admit, I was waiting for you to get out of there, roll around in the snow, and then go and get a tot of rum to finish. I don't know if they do that. Yeah, no, but, that, uh, that's what we do in Norway. I did right, ask them. Yeah. I said, yeah, this yeah. is a tradition we have is, you know, we normally, when you're in there, they also ask you loads of questions. And being yeah. a diver, you used to get ones like, what is Archimedes' principle? What is Boyle's law? And they're like, you can't even say your <laughs> name. Uh, but yeah, and you, oh. as you, you then come out, you roll in the snow, uh, put a layer of, of, of snow between you to start warming you up, and then you have a tot of rum. That's a tradition, but... No, I did. I didn't see any any rum. <laughs> uh, well, I always used to joke with my American friends. The difference, of course, between the British Army at war and the American Army at war is the British Army take the bar with them. So, uh, oh yeah. Um, so, all engineers they build them. Of course, you do. Uh, <laughs> toughest forces on earth on Netflix, where Dean and uh, his team uh, are going across some of the uh, most elite forces uh, in the. Uh, 
around the world and uh, of course you you also spent some time in the US and I was actually quite surprised that you got into the US military but you did sort of EOD and that's really kind of where buds started right with the US sort of clearance divers and things is that is that do I get that right I, I'm not sure where Bud started. It, it might be. You know, interestingly enough, a lot of the special forces training stemmed from the UK. So, like Delta Force came from right. the UK because they were resp- attached, I think, to the Special Air Service, weren't they? they went back. Yeah, and that, that's it. Yeah, Colonel right. Beckwith or some Beckwith. Beckwith. Charlie yeah. Beckwith. Yeah, Charlie Beckwith. He spent uh, two years, came back in 1977, and formed that. And and it was no different with the US Navy OD. It, it stemmed from the Royal Navy okay, cool. in the UK. And the Defence Diving School where I worked as a Royal Engineers. Chief instructor. We used to work with the 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 U.S. Navy OD equivalent uh, there. So there was a lot of a uh, there was a lot of crossover. But for me, I remember chatting to one of the training officers called Craig Jungers at at the U.S. Navy, and uh, you could see there was a, there was an element of apprehension about this show because they no they didn't know what the show was about. There wasn't yeah. anything to show them from previous, uh, but they were told by the Navy, "No, you will be filming this." Um, but actually, afterwards, they were so pleased that they did, and I I think. You know, recruitment is at an all-time low in in the military all over the world. I mean, yes. it's just a Marine Corps that's hitting their hitting their numbers. So this is a perfect platform for units because what surprised me, yeah, U.S. Navy, um, but it, even the Yag Commando, who are Tier One Special Forces from Austria. You know, normally I expect Tier Two units, but to see a Tier One unit, I thought was 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 brave. But I think you know, fingers crossed, we get a season two. There's going to be a lot more units knocking on the door, uh, asking to get some exposure. Well, I look forward to that. And uh, so you've also got a book out, Relentless, and uh, yes. it is uh, available on Amazon. And I bet you we link it in the show notes, Dean. So uh, tell us about the book. Yeah, so the book, when I finished the bike ride, I, I never, you know, I did the bike ride, so I wasn't smuggling people across borders. I Up until then, I'd remained low profile, everything yeah. I was doing. On, and so then I never had a website. First time I started social media. Um, and then, yeah, so I didn't see a career in guest speaking, TV or, or books. But yeah, straight away, I, I got offered a, a book deal. And so Relentless is almost like three stories in one. The first third of the book is my childhood and the, the military. Um, but obviously to protect uh, the special forces community, I don't go into any special forces stories. But the second phase of the book is all my private security stuff. And some of the stuff we touched on here, uh, but there's other stories in there. And like I said, I probably did more sensitive jobs as a civilian than I did when I was in the in the military. And then the final third is the bike ride that, that we touched on. It's all the lessons I learned from the, the previous two phases of the book and how I applied that in, into the bike ride, which takes me up to, to 2018. And so we're now looking at another book, uh, which talks about the, the recent evacuations, other security projects and then other other challenges in the future. Well, we look forward to covering all of that perhaps in the the future and uh, maybe we'll meet you at the SHOT Show when you come over to Vegas and uh, we can maybe interview you again. Um, Your Facebook page is deans.sbs and uh, your website is deans.com. So those are fairly easy to remember. Uh, Whenever I finish an interview, Dean, I ask the following question. Is there anything I've forgotten to ask you or anything you need to tell us? No, I don't mean there's anything you forgot to ask me at all. I mean, we've covered covered my life in, in a short period of time. I, I appreciate the time. Um, you know, I appreciate what the the emergency services do uh, here in the US. You know, it's it's a hard a hard job. And I have friends from the fire service, from the EMTs and from um, from the police department. So I understand how difficult the role is. You know, for me, my, my time is done. Um, but, you know, good luck to everyone out there. Well, hopefully in the future, as I say, team, we can catch up with you again and uh, and keep up and may- maybe see you uh, do some personal appearances. You never know. Awesome. But for the moment, sir, thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you so much, Rob. Thank you for having me. That's it. I thoroughly enjoyed talking to Dean. I'd like to thank him and also thank him for his service. What an amazing career. What an amazing backstory. And what amazing lessons that we can all take away in our police, fire and EMS practice. Don't forget, you can get all of your leadership notes and advice at policeone.com, ems1.com, and firerescue1.com. So that's it for now. I've been Rob Lawrence. My guest was Dean Stott. And until next time, bye for now.